Uh, welcome to the third edition of the IDF Nutrition and Health Symposium. My name is Caroline Limon and I'm the Director General of the IDF. IDF work since its establishment in 2000 in, in 1903 has been to lead the source of scientific and technical expertise uh, to the stakeholder across the dairy chain. Today, we have a vast network of over 1,200 experts spanning around 40 members country. IDF probably represents 74% of the global milk production. IDF mission is to help nourish the world with safe, nutritious, and sustainable dairy food. As a trusted and enduring source of authoritative scientific and technical information, IDF enables the development of policies, standard practices, and regulation that ensure the continued success of the dairy sector. This year's symposium aims to provide the latest scientific research on the dairy matrix and how it relates to different health outcomes. As the field of nutrition science evolves, we are witnessing a shift from the nutrient-based approach to old food approach when consistent food connects to health. The presentations in this session will cover the topic of diet, diet, type two diabetes, colorectal heart, colorectal heart and bone health to give insight into the mechanisms underlying the many health benefits associated with dairy. We are pleased to publish today a new fact sheet on the importance of the dairy matrix in the ev evaluation of the nutritional quantity uh, and health effect of food. Milk and dairy products are broadly recommended as part of a healthy eating patterns and food-based dietary guidelines. Their key role in human nutrition, health, and development through life is generally attributed to the nutrient richness. Research clearly demonstrates the impact of the old dairy food on health that extend beyond its individual components. They are the so-called dairy matrix health effects. For an overview of this session topic, you can access the IDF fact sheet on the importance of the day matrix in the evaluation of the health effects of food to the IDF website. And actually you will find a link in the chat right now. As mentioned earlier, this is the third edition of the IDF Nutrition and Health Symposium. You can find materials from our previous symposia on the IDF website. The previous events cover our dairy related to the topic of non-communicable disease, and health across the life course. While you're on that site, I would also recommend that you find the registration for the 2023 IDF World Dairy Summit. This year, World Dairy Summit will be held on October 16 to 19 in Chicago and will involve global and industry leader, dairy experts, scientists, technical specialists, farmers, and more to bring you the latest and the more significant issue facing the global dairy sector today and tomorrow. I also encourage you on our website to visit our publication section. You will find a various uh, level of, of technical publication uh, that might interest you as well. You can actually look by topics. If you're looking for nutrition, you can just filter nutrition and find all the latest publication on the top. If you would like to stay up to date with our work, you can sign up for our email newsletter on the IDF website, and you can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we regularly share our update and next event. I'd like to thank those who contributed to the organization of this webinar today, to wish a great event to all of the participants. And I will actually now like to introduce you, your moderator for today. And uh, so our moderator is Professor Corina Walsh. Professor Walsh is a full professor at the School of Allied Health Profession Department of Nutrition and Dietetic at the University of the Free State in South Africa. She's also the president of the Nutrition Society of South Africa and serves on the Consumer Education Panel for Milk South Africa. So Professor Walsh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Caroline. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending where you are in the world today. So it's my privilege to welcome you to this exciting online nutrition and health symposium arranged by the International Dairy Federation. 
The title of today's symposium is Beyond Nut Nutrients, the Health Effects of Whole Foods. So as you've heard, my name is Karina Walsh. I'm also a registered dietitian and I'm from the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics at the University of the Free State in Bloemfontein, South Africa. And at the moment, it's seven o'clock in the morning here. So I have the honor of moderating this symposium today. As nutrition science advances, we are learning more and more about the food matrix effect and its significance in comprehending the effects that food has on our health. One of the most thoroughly studied examples of the food matrix effect is the dairy matrix, which has been shown to be, have beneficial influences on several metabolic outcomes and systems that we will hear more of today. To unpack the science behind the food matrix as it applies to dairy and to explain how it affects health, we are fortunate to have several experts with us today. We will listen to five pre-recorded presentations ranging from the dairy matrix in general to the link between dairy products and cancer, bone health, heart health, and diabetes. This will be followed by a 20 to 25 minute live panel discussion that some of our experts will join in person. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping matters to mention. This meeting will be recorded for future viewing. If you have questions during the presentations or in the live panel discussion, please type them into the Q&A box. We will try to answer as many as possible during the panel discussion. Lastly, if you wish, you can use the live transcript option at the bottom of your screen to read the subtitles. It's my pleasure then to introduce you to Dr. Nancy Aburto, the Deputy Director of the Food and Nutrition Division of the Food and Agriculture Organization. She will start the symposium with some opening remarks. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. It is my great pleasure to be joining you to kick off the 2023 International Dairy Federation Nutrition and Health Symposium. My name is Nancy Aborto, and I am the Deputy Director of the Food and Nutrition Division of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. The theme of this year's event, Beyond Nutrients, the health effects of whole foods resonates particularly strongly with me in my role at FAO. The FAO has a vision for nutrition of a world where all people are eating healthy diets from efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems. To realize this vision, FAO's mission in nutrition is to tackle malnutrition in all of its forms, by accelerating impactful policies and actions across agri-food systems to enable healthy diets for all. An important responsibility of my division, the Food and Nutrition Division, is to enable FAO to fulfill this mission. Now I'm walking you through all of this because I want to emphasize our focus on healthy diets from agri-food systems, which means we focus on food-based approaches to address malnutrition. Now we at FAO, we work in partnership with many partners that focus on the extremely important role of nutrients. They build the science base and expand our knowledge of how nutrients influence health and how they influence one another for better health. This work is so important and has led to extremely valuable policy initiatives, things like iodization of salt, screening, screening for anemia, and even food and nutrition labeling. And of course, we use the knowledge of nutrients as a piece of the puzzle to inform our efforts. But our focus is on foods. 
One reason for this, of course, is that we don't eat nutrients, we eat food. But another important reason is related to what we are talking about today. That reason is when it comes to what we eat, the sum of the parts can be greater than the whole. That is to say, the health value of foods is more than the sum of the nutrient parts. Therefore, advancing the science of whole foods is extremely important for informing how to best tackle both undernutrition and diet-related non-communicable diseases. We have long known that nutrient effectiveness to support good health is dependent on bioavailability, absorption in the gut, and interactions with other nutrients amongst other factors. There's also growing evidence regarding the influence of the food matrix, and we will hear a lot about that today. And there's growing evidence on how whole foods impact our microbiome in positive ways and in ways that differ across the life course. We also have increased understanding of what we don't yet know. For example, we're aware that there are hundreds of thousands of edible plant and animal species in the world, but we only have food composition data for a few thousand of those. We're also aware that there are more than 26,000 distinct biochemicals in food, but we can only reliably quantify hundreds of those. But what indeed is exciting is that this field is growing. As nutritional science has grown as a discipline, our knowledge has evolved and we know more about edible species. We know more about food composition. And we are also understanding how critical it is and why we need to consider foods in their holistic role in influencing metabolic processes and reducing disease risk. Today, of course, we'll be focusing on dairy. In this sector, for almost everyone in the world, there's an immediate association of intake with the delivery of protein and calcium. And for you scientists, of course, you'll also be considering other nutrients immediately. But today's discussion will provide some deeper insight into those whole foods. We will consider the evidence behind the complex structure of dairy foods to form a holistic understanding of the benefits of these foods, again, as whole foods. Symposia like the one today and the evidence that will be shared, discussed, and debated are vital to help inform the work that we do at FAO. Our work across agri-food systems to enable healthy diets for all for the achievement of sustainable development goals must be evidence-informed, and we rely on robust scientific, scientific evidence like what will be shared today as an important contribution to our efforts. So I thank you all for your contribution and I thank you all for your participation today. And I wish you a fruitful nutrition and health symposium. Thank you to Dr. Alberto for opening this symposium in such an apt way. Our next speaker is Dr. Hannah Holscher from the USA. Dr. Halshin is, is an Associate Professor of Nutrition in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition and a member of the Division of Nutritional Sciences, the Institute of Genomic Biology and the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois in the USA. She completed postdoctoral training focused on the human microbiome, a PhD in Nutritional Sciences and a BS in food science and human nutrition at the University of Illinois. She's also a registered dietitian. Dr. Halsh's laboratory uses clinical interventions and computational approaches to study the interactions of nutrition, the gastrointestinal microbiome and health. We look forward to hearing her presentation titled, Looking Beyond the Nutrition Fact Label, The Case for the Food Matrix. Firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this symposium. I'm excited to be able to talk to you all today about the concept of the food matrix. In this presentation, I'll be highlighting the complexity of food and encourage you to look beyond the nutrition facts label and consider the food matrix. This slide lists my disclosures 
for the past 12 months, including my employment at the University of Illinois, my grants, and speaking honoraria. I'd like to begin with a brief outline of what I'll be discussing in this presentation. In the first part, I'll introduce the concept of the food matrix and provide examples of food matrices impact on nutrient bioaccessibility and health outcomes. In the last part of the presentation, I'll provide a few examples of matrix-specific health effects and plausible biological mechanisms of the health effects. As nutritional scientists, we all acknowledge that diet affects health, including cardiometabolic health, adiposity, and neurocognition. Historically, research has focused on reductionist, nutrient-driven approaches to understanding the effects of diet on health. However, increasingly, research is indicating that the consumption of whole foods, as compared to isolated nutrients contained within foods, can have surprising effects, and that the whole is often greater than the sum of its parts. Ultimately, we eat foods, which contain nutrients. Therefore, further exploration of these phenomena are warranted so that we can better understand the nutrition health interface. So let's consider the concept of the food matrix. The food matrix is defined by the USDA as nutrient and non-nutrient components of foods and their molecular relations. The food matrix is thought to contribute to diet health relationships. And my group is particularly interested in this as complex food matrices, such as those within whole grains or nuts, can reduce the bioaccessibility or digestion and absorption of nutrients, thereby contributing to the substrate availability for the intestinal microbiota. As the microbiota can metabolize non-digested food components often found in complex matrices like fiber, polyphenols, and or bioactives, it has the capacity to significantly influence health physiology, therefore helping connect diet to host health. Let's consider the complexity of foods a bit more, noting that both food science and nutritional aspects of the diet can affect health outcomes. Ultimately, foods contain nutrients that vary in their bioaccessibility. And by bioaccessibility, I'm referring to the fraction of an ingested compound, be it a nutrient or bioactive, which is liberated from the food matrix within the gastrointestinal tract. This figure highlights some important components of plant matrices, including the different types of fibers within the plant cell wall and the encapsulation of starch granules within plant-based cell matrices. As we know, fibers are resistant to digestion. Thus, plant-based nutrients will vary in their bioaccessibility depending on external factors, such as milling or cooking, to disrupt the plant cell walls to liberate nutrients, like starch, for digestion and absorption. However, some digestible polysaccharides may be inaccessible to digestive enzymes within the food matrix due to the cooking process. For example, resistance can be conferred following cooking and cooling, resulting in retrogradation of starch molecules. This can affect physiological responses, such as the glycemic response to the ingestion of pasta that's been cooked and then cooled. Ultimately, the different molecular configurations in dietary fibers results in their different physical chemical characteristics. External factors like temperature, pH, mechanical disruption, and fermentation also affect the food matrix. As we just discussed, heating and cooling can make starch resistant to digestion. Acidity can denature proteins in meat to facilitate the digestion and absorption of amino acids. Grinding almonds into a paste disrupts the plant cell wall, increasing the metabolizable energy content compared to whole almonds. And utilizing microorganisms to ferment milk to produce yogurt changes the physical structure from a liquid into a gel. Ultimately, Food matrices affect digestion and absorption. The physical structure created by 
a combination of nutritive components within the food can act independently of its individual components during digestion and absorption. Compared with an isolated nutrient, certain matrices protect their nutrients and bioactive compounds against degradation. Food matrices affect digestion and absorption, and this degradation, or lack thereof, will also affect substrate availability for the microbiota within the intestinal lumen. To summarize this portion of the presentation, the food matrix, or the physical domain that contains food components, like nutrients, provides functions that are different than if the nutrients were consumed in isolation. Matrices affect the bioaccessibility of nutrients, meaning that the food's ability to be digested, absorbed, and fermented is impacted by the physical structure of the food, as well as the external factors that have acted upon it prior to consumption. Increasingly, in vitro, preclinical, and clinical research is demonstrating that the food matrix effect has physiological implications, such as the metabolizable energy of a food and the effects of consumption on health outcomes, such as blood glucose and cholesterol concentrations. It's important to look beyond the nutrition facts label and consider the food matrix because the nutritional content of foods, be it eggs, grapes, nuts, or milk will vary based upon how the original matrix is modified through cooking, grinding, or fermentation. Now, I'd like to walk you through a couple of case studies on the relevance of the food matrix. I'll begin by first discussing the effects of processing on nutrient bioaccessibility of almonds. Nuts are nutrient-dense foods that contain fiber, unsaturated fatty acids, and polyphenols, along with other types of fats, protein, vitamins, and minerals. Epidemiological and interventional trials have demonstrated that consumption of nuts contributes to benefits to cardiovascular health, glycemic control, and body composition. To better understand the effects of processing on the metabolizable energy of almonds, which may underlie some of the associated health benefits of nut consumption reported in the literature, my colleagues at the USDA Agricultural Research Service in Beltsville, Maryland, designed an elegant, complete feeding crossover design trial to determine how roasting, chopping, and grinding almonds affected nutrient bioaccessibility. Adults participating in this study underwent five study conditions, which differed only by the inclusion of different forms of almonds. After each three-week condition, the participants underwent a washout period prior to randomization to each subsequent condition. Let's first look at what they reported with regard to how processing affected the physical properties of the almonds. Figure one from this publication is images from the fracture of one whole natural almond, one whole roasted almond, or one gram chopped roasted almonds after compression. These experiments revealed that the whole natural almonds had a greater hardness, but a lower number of particles per image compared to whole roasted almonds. So the physical properties related to the processing of the almonds ultimately affected the metabolizable energy of the almonds. This table shows the almond type, its measured metabolizable energy, and its estimated metabolizable energy using Atwater factors. What you should note is that the whole natural, whole roasted, and chopped roasted almonds provided less metabolizable energy than predicted. This is important because it means that these undigested nutrients were available for microbial metabolism. And this is where my research laboratory was able to come in and help to expand our understanding of these results by characterizing how almond processing also affected the intestinal microbiota. This figure shows that the consumption of roasted chopped almonds increased rosburia. There was also a numeric increase within the whole roasted condition and the whole natural condition. Notably, almond butter was almost identical to the control. This is interesting because it suggests that disrupting the almond plant cell wall through roasting and grinding into butter liberated the nutrients in a way that makes them accessible to human digestion and absorption, thereby limiting the availability of nutrients for the microbiota. 
other bacteria such as Lactospira and Dialister had similar response profiles. In summary, almond processing impacted the nutrient bioaccessibility. Almonds had up to 25% less metabolizable energy than predicted by Atwater factors. And consumption of different forms of almonds differentially affected the human fecal microbiota. Let's move on to a different case study and consider the relevance of the dairy matrix on health. Firstly, dairy is considered to be an excellent source of high quality protein and calcium, as well as other vitamins and minerals. There are three main types of dairy matrices, liquid, semi-solid or gel, and solid. The dairy matrix also contains different bioactives or food constituents other than those that meet basic nutritional needs that are responsible for a change in human health. Examples of bioactives in dairy include the milk fat globular membrane, which contains the different fatty acids, and bioactive peptides, which are protein fragments produced via modifications or cleavage from parent proteins. Let's first look at an example of how the bioaccessibility of fat is affected by the dairy matrix. This figure on the right shows the significant increase in fecal fat excretion in 11 adults that participated in a randomized crossover study that compared two diets, one high in calcium from low-fat dairy products and one low in calcium. These results indicate that increasing the intake of calcium from low-fat dairy products doubled the total fecal fat excretion. The results may partially explain why a high calcium diet can help contribute to weight loss. The high phosphate content, as well as the presence of the milk fat globular membrane, are also hypothesized to contribute to health effects of dairy consumption. These health effects include associations reported in epidemiological studies and results of intervention trials demonstrating that yogurt consumers, for example, have lower body weight than non-consumers and changes in blood lipids is thought to be a reflection of the effect of calcium on bile acid reabsorption, which leads to the de novo synthesis of bile acids from plasma cholesterol as a substrate. Moving on to focus more specifically on yogurt. Yogurt is created through microbial fermentation of milk by the lactic acid bacteria Streptococcus thermophilus and Lactobacillus bulgaricus. Fermentation results in the gel-like structure of yogurt and contributes to the presence of bioactives, which have associated health benefits. For example, some dairy-derived tripeptides have been shown to have increased angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitory activity, thereby contributing to reduced blood pressure. Exopolysaccharides, produced by lactic acid bacteria, play a structural role in the yogurt matrix by increasing its viscosity. They may also contribute to gastrointestinal immunity. Beta-galactosidases, derived from the live microorganisms in yogurt, contribute to lactose digestion within the intestines, providing a notable benefit to lactose maldigesters. I'd also like to briefly discuss the relevance of the matrix for probiotics. Probiotics are frequently added to fermented dairy products like kefir and yogurt. Some of the strain-specific health benefits as reduced duration of diarrhea and improving constipation. What I find particularly interesting is that there's an interaction between the dairy matrix and probiotics in that in vitro research has demonstrated that probiotic survival is better within yogurt as opposed to free probiotic cells or probiotic cells that have been microencapsulated. Some of the proposed mechanisms for this improvement in probiotic survival include the contributions of the yogurt to buffering stomach acidity, the presence of lactic acid bacteria-derived exopolysaccharides and milk fat globular membranes offering protection in the gastrointestinal tract, or the presence of lactose as an energy source for the probiotics. Let's take a moment to summarize the concepts related to the dairy matrix. Firstly, we discuss the contributions of calcium within dairy foods on increasing fat excretion, which may underlie the matrix-associated health benefits as they relate to cholesterol concentrations and body weight. Specific to probiotic survival, the provision of probiotics within yogurt has been shown in vitro to enhance probiotic survivability, which may have relevance to the demonstrated health effects of certain probiotic strains that are added into yogurts and other fermented dairy products. 
Other bioactives present in the dairy matrix include the presence of beta galactosidases from live cultures in fermented dairy, which contribute to lactose digestion, tripeptides having antihypertensive effects, and exopolysaccharides contributing to functional and health properties of yogurt consumption. In summary, I hope that this presentation has provided you with some insights as to why it's important to look beyond the nutrition facts label and consider the importance of the food matrix as you conduct and evaluate science related to nutrition and health. Food is complex and the physical structure of the food will affect nutrient bioaccessibility and ultimately human health. It's an exciting time to be a nutrition scientist because of our growing <laughs> understanding of the food matrix and matrix health connections. Thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to further discussion at the end of the session. So thank you very much to Dr. Holscher for that fascinating presentation on how the dairy matrix affects nutrient bioavailability, nutrient digestion, and absorption kinetics in relation to recent research on almonds and dairy. Our next speaker is Dr. Luigi Riccardiello from Italy. He's an associate professor in the Department of Medical and Surgical Sciences at the University of Bologna. He has a broad background in gastroenterology and digestive endoscopy with specific training and expertise in the genetics and management of hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes and sporadic colorectal cancer. His research is particularly focused on the prevention of colorectal cancer, exploring the benefits of chemo prevention. As PI or co-investigator of several Italian Foundation for Cancer Research funded grants, he has extensively worked on the chemo preventative potential of multiple compounds in hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes. His presentation is titled, Are Dairy Products Protective? towards colorectal cancer development. Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is uh, Luigi Ricciardiello. I'm Associate Professor of Gastroenterology at the University of Bologna. I'm uh, actually specialized in colorectal cancer prevention, and I'd like to thank the IDF for having me here today. It's a great honor, and I'll be talking about possible role of dairy products uh, towards colorectal cancer development protection. This is my disclosure of conflict of interest. Now, colorectal cancer is one of the major uh, causes of cancer incidence and death worldwide. It accounts for approximately 2 million uh, colorectal cancer cases diagnosed each year worldwide. And uh, it is also the third uh, uh, most common cause of cancer death worldwide. That is why it's actively researched. And in particular, there is huge research in uh, uh, prevention, both primary and secondary prevention. Now, uh, to get to colorectal cancer, it doesn't take uh, one or two years. Uh, um, the development go through goes through the uh, intermediate steps of uh, growth of. Uh, uh, permanent lesions in particular called uh, um, adenomatous polyps and this takes about 10 to 15 years. Uh, the important thing is that we are recognizing several factors that are playing a role in colorectal cancer development which are acting on mechanisms that are relevant for um, cellular homeostasis in the stem cell compartment and in particular we are recognizing inflammation as a major uh, role in, in colorectal cancer development. What are the risk factors of colorectal cancer? In, we recognize age, smoking, hereditary predisposition, which actually accounts for about 10% of all cases, in particular Lynch syndrome and familial adenomatous polyposis, long-term uh, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, Alcohol consumption is now recognized as a major risk factor for colorectal cancer together with type 2 diabetes and obesity. Obesity is a major, major risk factor for colorectal cancer. But of course, we are recognizing also dietary habits as uh, key factors for the predisposition of development of the disease. 
Now, as far as age, we know that uh, uh, coronary cancer increase in, uh, risk increase, increases with age. In particular, we have a uh, cancer screening programs that are designed from age 50 to 74, and that is because we have the highest peak of incidence. However, in recent years, we have been observing uh, increases numbers of uh, early onset coronary cancer, where are cases that uh, occur be before the age of 50, uh, which are very difficult to spot. Uh, uh, they are uh, always uh, or almost always uh, uh, advanced cases and they, they are poorly respondent. And this is occurring not only in the United States, which has actually measured this already uh, 15 years ago, but also throughout Europe. And what we believe is that uh, this sharp increase of uh, early onset coronary cancer uh, is mostly uh, driven by lifestyle changes, in particular obesity and uh, and, and dietary habits. And as a matter of fact, in the United States right now, early onset coronary cancer accounts for uh, approximately 10% of all coronary cancer cases. But of course, we recognize, uh, uh, as I said, obesity, obesity because uh, it leads to, you know, changes uh, in the uh, um, the systemic changes, in, including circulating cytokines, but all, mostly, you know, changes also in the gut microbiome, which actually perpetrate uh, a, um, you know, uh, the sustainability of uh, inflammation, which actually would change uh, proliferation and apoptosis uh, in, uh, in the colonic lumen. And as I was saying, um, diet is also playing a huge role in coronal cancer development. Uh, we recognize that the Western diet dietary pattern is strongly associated with colorectal cancer and also with adenoma development as it is shown by this study that was recently published. And this is also important for early onset colorectal cancer as opposed to, as we know, the Mediterranean diet, which uh, has a protective effect toward the colorectal adenomas development. And as we know from recent meta-analysis, the Mediterranean diet is strongly protective toward coronal cancer development. But, uh, you know, what about dairy products? Uh, this is the topic of uh, the main topic of my talk. Now, dairy products uh, have been explored for almost 30 years uh, in terms of protective um, uh, effects towards coronal cancer development. And this is the old uh, uh, meta-analysis from Aune and colleagues published in 2012, which showed, clearly showed from uh, pooling uh, cohort studies that, um, you know, total dairy products, uh, including the analysis of high versus low intake, together also with the dose response analysis uh, per 400 grams daily, are uh, strongly protective towards colorectal cancer, but also um, and, and this was mainly driven by the uh, consumption of milk, as you can see from, from this slide that uh, milk has, uh, was found to be protective both when analyzing high versus low intake or uh, intakes of, of 200 grams daily uh, in the populations that were explored. This was not found, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, 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 from cheese, uh, both when analyzing uh, high versus low intake and, uh, um, and uh, uh, consumption of 50 grams daily. But, you know, other studies are subsequently have shown a uh, uh, protective effect of uh, uh, dairy products toward colorectal cancer. In particular, an analysis of 11 years follow up of the uh, EPIC cohort found a strong protective effect from total milk uh, consumption, also from whole fat and skim milk. While there was uh, there were some mixed data on cheese and yogurt uh, because they were showing uh, some protective effect in the categorical models, but not in the linear model models. What is really interesting is that. As uh, people always uh, believed that calcium was uh, one of, of the main key factors uh, explaining the protective effect of uh, uh, dairy products uh, in terms of colorectal cancer development, what was found that uh, uh, was that dairy sources of calcium were uh, inversely associated to colorectal cancer development. Uh, as opposed to non-dairy calcium, which were not associated. And I will get into this topic in a minute. 
Other meta-analysis have also corroborated this uh, data on dairy products. What, what was really interesting from this meta-analysis published in 2018 was that the, uh, you know, the data uh, on dairy was even stronger per, of course, uh, uh, increased number of servings uh, as, a, as, a, as opposed to um, other well-known protective factors towards colorectal cancer, such as fruit, vegetables, and whole grains. Of course, this was also corroborating the uh, knowledge that red meat and processed meat uh, have a, a pro-carcinogenic uh, effect in, in terms of colon cancer development. And finally, there was a, a very recent study, which is a subsequent follow-up of the EPIC cohort, which found a strong protective effect of several type of uh, foods and food components uh, towards colorectal cancer development as opposed to others. And clearly, demarcation with this, within this volcano plot uh, showing that uh, cheese and milk are highly protective. But what are the possible mechanisms behind the protective effects? Uh, it was known that, for example, uh, you know, the uh, dairy products would, uh, you know, bind to pro-inflammatory secondary bile acids and ionized fatty acids, which would reduce cell prol pro proliferation and promote cell differentiation. And furthermore, it was believed that calcium had a chemopreventive effect because of direct growth with training and differentiation and apoptosis inducing action. But what is really interesting, the recent data, this is a very well conducted study, which was published in the England Journal of Medicine in 2015, uh, which actually randomized patients at high risk for recurrent adenomas, uh, showed no protective effect from car car calcium carbonate to 1200 milligrams daily, as opposed to no calcium intake indicating that uh, there is a, a huge difference probably between dairy source of calcium as opposed to uh, uh, the um, uh, administration of calcium carbonate. Also, there is a, a, a huge interest in uh, fermented foods. Uh, in particular, initial data indicated that yogurt consumption has a protective effect towards colorectal cancer uh, development. Uh, this has been uh, um, published uh, within the EPIC cohort. And what is really interesting, of course, is that you see an increase in uh, uh, effect, uh, protective effect, uh, based also on the level of intake. And this was higher in men as opposed to, uh, uh, to, to women. Uh, but recently, a meta-analysis also corroborated this uh, knowledge, indicating a protective effect of yogurt towards colorectal cancer, in particular, a stronger effect on rectal cancer. Now, this difference between colon and rectal cancer needs to be further explored, and there is no information on what this might be triggered. Also, kefir has been recently uh, uh, studied. Initially, it was studied as a possible, uh, trying to understand whether there were some direct effects on colon cancer cells. And what was found was that kefir has uh, an effect by inducing apoptosis in cancer cells. A and B panel are uh, KCO2 cells and uh, CND are H, uh, HT29. These are models of coronal cancer. And as you can see, the number of apoptotic cells were, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, more, uh, were higher in uh, cells that were treated with kefir as opposed to milk. But also kefir was taken uh, into uh, uh, the animal uh, uh, models of coronal cancer, which is a chemically induced, uh, the adoptive methane model which showed that uh, exposing the animals to kefir reduces the number of tumors uh, and also reduces the size of tumor. And this is mostly driven by reduced inflammatory markers like uh, uh, TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, uh, uh, interleukin-17A. And this is something that is uh, relevant, as I was discussing before, that inflammation is a relevant factor in promoting colorectal cancer. Finally, I think all this data has to be taken into consideration with uh, what we are now studying, which is uh, how diet is 
actually change and modulate the gut microbiome diet. We know that is the major factor changing and modulating the gut microbiome, which is also relevant in uh, changing the host immunity and also, um, uh, you know, uh, in relation also to the risk of coronal cancer. Now, we know that there are specific bacteria strains that are strongly associated with coronal cancer development. In particular, Fusobacterium nucleatum has been found to be strongly associated with coronal carcinoma and adenoma. As a matter of fact, we, if we expose an animal model like the APC mean mouse model, which makes a lot of polyps, we can boost the carcinogenesis and increase the number of, and the size of these polyps. But also, if we um, use a different type of animal models, but also in, in humans, and if we provide high-fat diet, we can see this is an animal model that the high-fat diet can strongly promote correctal tumorigenesis by modulating the gut microbiota, in particular with the enhancement of allistipus uh, species. And as opposed to by using and modulating the gut microbiota, for example, with the Mediterranean diet, we have actually recently published that if we use a, a if we uh, make a Mediterranean diet mix and we provide this to animals, uh, we can actually reduce the number and size of tumors, uh, uh, you know, opposing the effect of a high fat diet. And this has a strong effect by addressing the microbiota structure in a more protective uh, fashion. And this has been also widely explored or has been recently explored in, uh, in dairy products, in particular in fermented milk products. And as you can see, the effect of fermented milk products have been found to be uh, um, you know, protective uh, in a sense uh, by, uh, you know, redressing the gut microbioma uh, in, in a more protective, uh, um, uh, um, in more protective strains, but also by increasing the level of short chain fatty acid, which are actually immune modulators and prevent cancer development. And finally, kefir, for example, is being uh, used in uh, a, an animal model of coronal cancer, which is the DMH rat model, uh, showing that kefir can reduce the number, the tumor number and size uh, by reducing also the inflammatory markers uh, in this setting and changing the gut microbiome with a more protective uh, um, uh, structure. So in conclusion, so as a, um, we know that coronal cancer is a preventable disease. There is overwhelming evidence that dairy products can prevent coronal cancer. There is a also strong indication that matrix effect is a probably critical. Think about you know the dairy uh, calcium as opposed to the supplemented calcium. Of course, we need to have more mechanistic, mechanistic evidence understanding the preventive effects. But there is strong indication that fermented milk products uh, act through modulation of the gut microbiota, and this has a critical effect on reducing inflammation and, of course, risk of coronary cancer. And I'd like to thank you all for being with me today, and thank also to the organizers. Uh, so thank you so much to Dr. Ricardiello for demonstrating that dairy is indeed protective against colorectal cancer. Our next speaker is Dr. Sandra Juliana from Australia. Dr. Juliana is a senior research fellow in the Department of Medicine, University of Melbourne, researching nutrition and exercise across the lifespan, specifically to improve musculoskeletal health. Relative to aging, her work has focused on food-based approaches to prevent falls, fractures, and malnutrition in older adults in aged care. She has provided input into the quality and safety standards for aged care, was summoned to present evidence at the Royal Commission in aged care, and is a member of the National Aged Care Advisory Council. She's a strong advocate for improving nutritional care and quality of life via improved food provision in aged care. We look forward to hearing her talk titled Dairy and Health Outcomes, 
bone health in older adults. These are my relative disclosures. Bone is a very dynamic tissue and we can see that there are changes throughout the lifespan. So childhood is characterised by constant growth which is similar in boys and girls and we actually have data that shows that boys actually have a wider bone even though they're accruing the same amount of bone as girls but it's during puberty that we see the divergence in the sexes. So for example, we see that during that pubertal period, girls increase their bone mineral density earlier than boys, but boys have a much larger magnitude of gain during that pubertal period. So adulthood is marked by a period of bone maintenance. And as you can see from the graph, that males start adulthood with a much larger skeleton. And then in old age, we see a decline in bone in both males and females. And we see during that menopausal period, there's a rapid decline in bone. So if we look at the role of dairy across these particular times, in particular, growth is the time in which we can add bone on. But during growth, we see that there is quite a mixture. If I had a group of children in their last year of primary school, you'll have some that are quite small. You, have, you may have others that have actually gone through puberty. So it's important that when we're looking at children, that they are matched for maturity so that um, maturity itself doesn't perhaps uh, skew results. So one of the few trials that actually did this well um, supplemented young girls with milk and as you can see from the graph the milk supplemented girls accrued more total body bone mineral density relative to the controls. Now the feature of this study that perhaps made it as successful as it was is that their calcium intake was moderate. They used just one sex so girls only and again if you look at the graph to the left you can see if I had boys during that pubertal period their growth could often mask what's occurring because of the dairy. The girls were matched for puberty, they had very few dropouts and these girls had good compliance. Now this issue of compliance I'll bring up repeatedly because the benefit of dairy is in its consumption and its consumption across the lifespan. It's not a thing that we can have once and then not have again. It should be part of the overall lifestyle. So during adulthood, again, we have this period of bone maintenance. A few of the trials that are done have been in premenopausal women. This is one trial in that the women in the um, dairy supplemented group maintained their lumbar spine bone mineral density in contrast to a loss in those in the control group. Now, the consumption of the dairy represented by the calcium intake in the table below, you can see that they've actually maintained good compliance over the 36 month period because they've maintained this high calcium intake in contrast to the controls that were consuming just sort of nearly half of what the intervention group consumed. So in contrast to that, this trial also looked at lumbar spine bone mineral density, also using milk as the medium of dairy. And we can see that there was an increase at around six months, but that increase was no longer evident from 12 months onwards. And again, if you look at the dairy consumption represented by the calcium intake, their calcium intake went down in the second year. So again, this is pointing to that issue of compliance. When compliance was good, the benefits of the dairy were obvious. When compliance is low, we're unlikely to see a benefit. And then finally, during um, adulthood or older age, I should say, we get that decline in bone. So the idea here is to slow down the decline. And I'm going to point to two trials. This first one is again in women only in their postmenopausal women. 
And what we observed here was total body bone mineral density was maintained in the dairy supplemented group for 30 months, in contrast to the controls where we see this slow loss of bone over the 30 month period. And again, when you looked at the calcium intake as a measure of compliance with the dairy, we can see that the dairy group consumed over 1100 milligrams of calcium per day in contrast to the controls. This next trial is one of the few that included males in the trial using just milk. So what I've tried to do with this work is represent trials that have used just dairy, not dairy as a vehicle for another nutrient. This is a short term study, only 12 weeks. But interestingly, when they consume three extra glasses of milk a day, we saw an increase in IGF-1. So this is starting to indicate that we are, have an ability to alter muscle as well as bone. And the panel on the right, we see the parathyroid hormone was lowered in the dairy supplementation group. This is representing a suppression of bone resorption um, with dairy consumption. So bone fragility is a problem if a person fractures. Someone can go through life never fracturing and could have bone fragility. So the primary outcome that has not been looked at yet when we look at dairy and bone are fractures. There are two periods during the lifespan when fractures are high. The first period is during adolescence in both males and females, but more specifically in males. This is thought to be for two or a number of reasons, but the two key reasons is during puberty, peak height velocity occurs about six months before peak bone mineral content velocity. So what we have is an acceleration in the length of the bone and a delay in the consolidation of the bone. And this is believed to be, uh, produce a period of um, transient fragility. But also we know that adolescents often have high risk behaviours as well, so we have to remember that. The other period of time is old age, and we can see again in both males and females that there's an exponential increase in fracture risk in older age. So what we've lacked for this entire time to date is we've not had a randomised controlled trial looking at dairy food, just dairy food and fracture risk reduction. So the trial that I'm going to uh, demonstrate to you today was done in older adults in aged care homes. There was a number of reasons for this. One, 30% of all the hip fractures occur arise from aged care homes. As an example, in Australia, only 6% of people over the age of 65 live in an aged care home, yet they contribute 30% to the total burden of hip fractures. We also know that their rates of falls are extremely high and it's five times higher than if I have similar people in the community. They have high rates of malnutrition 68% of residents are malnourished or at risk of malnutrition. Their calcium intake is low. In this case, it's less than half of recommended. Their protein intake is under one gram per kilogram body weight. And also they have low dairy intake. In this case, we observed it was one and a half servings per day. So in explaining this, the, number, the servings of dairy I've represented down um, to the left, and it's 250 ml of milk, 200 grams of yogurt, and 40 grams of cheese. So this may need to be converted to the dairy servings um, relative to you. Again, key stress is that we're using just milk, yogurt, and cheese in terms of the dairy that's provided in this trial. So in order to see the number of fractures and have the power to detect fractures, this trial involved 60 aged care homes and over 7,000 residents. 30 of the homes were randomised to provide extra dairy on their menu and the other 30 homes went about their usual menus. We followed all 60 homes for two years and we monitored all falls, all fractures and mortality. In a subgroup of residents, we did more extensive testing and we looked at bone density and structure and bone metabolism. 
This intervention was provided through the food service at each of the aged care homes. By this, all residents were able to have the options of the dairy. The dairy was put across the entire menu so people could choose. We used dairy foods that residents selected more than dictating what they were to consume. Some of the methods that we used was we added dairy, so it might have been cheese or yogurt, to snacks. We fortified milk with skim milk powder to increase the protein and calcium content. We substituted things like gravies for um, cheese or milk-based sources, and we modified recipes to increase the dairy content. So if we look first at the top left-hand panel, this is the number of dairy servings that were consumed over the 24-month period. On average, the residents consume three and a half servings, and the key point, as mentioned earlier, is that they maintained this intake for the 24-month period. The panel below is dietary calcium, and again, represented um, through the dairy, their intake was around 1,100 milligrams per day for the 24-month period. Dietary protein increased to 72 grams per day in the intervention group, which is yellow, and they achieved an average of 1.1 gram of protein per kilogram body weight, unlike the controls, which were around 0.9 grams per kilogram body weight. And interestingly, there was no change in energy intake. So often we were substituting nutrient poor foods for the dairy food. When we look specifically at the data, this is the cumulative probability of an event and our intervention is in yellow. So those that were consuming from the high dairy menus, we observed a 33% reduction in all fractures and specifically a 46% reduction in hip fractures. And the, the deviation in the two curves um, was significant at around six months. When we looked at falls, we observed an 11% reduction in falls. Now keep in mind, if you look in the control group, over 60% of residents experienced a fall over the 24 month period. And to put it into perspective, we observed 23,000 falls over that 24 month period over the 60 facilities. And what we observed is that mortality was unchanged. So we have residents that were living the same period of time, but with fewer fractures and fewer falls. When we look specifically at some of the potential mechanisms of the benefit, we observed that in the blue, which is the controls, we observed around a 2% loss of bone mineral density at the tibia and the radius, in contrast to the dairy supplemented group where bone was maintained. And again, when we looked at bone metabolism, we observed that in the dairy supplemented group in the yellow, that there was an increase in IGF-1. And for CTX, which is the marker of bone resorption, so how quickly the bone is breaking down, we observed that the controls continued to increase bone resorption that was maintained or halted um, in the intervention group. We also looked at body composition and in our dairy supplemented group, we observed that weight was maintained, specifically when we looked at lean mass, lean mass of the arms and legs was maintained, in contrast to our controls where we observed significant weight loss. And this weight loss was occurring both from loss of muscle at the arms and legs, as well as fat mass. And in Australia, weight loss is a significant indicator of quality in a facility. So it has a large bearing on um, how, the, how well that the facility is actually being um, judged. Malnutrition risk. We use the mini nutrition assessment tool and we observed that amongst all the um, residents, that those in the control group, we observed a one point reduction in the mini nutrition assessment score, but this was maintained in the intervention group. And when we looked at the categories within the mini nutrition assessment tool, the categories of malnourished, at risk of malnutrition and normal nutritional status, if you look at 
the blue, which represents the controls, we can see compared to baseline, there were fewer people in the normal, um, normally nourished group. And there were um, at 12 months, there were more people in the malnourished group. So people were shifting into a category that was one worse than they started. In contrast to the intervention group, we see that that very much just maintained the category that they were in. Now, malnutrition is an, uh, has a significant increased risk of falls, and we also see a non-significant risk of um, people who are at risk of malnutrition. So this may partly explain some of the differences that we saw in the rates of falls. So in contrast, when older adults that had low levels of calcium and protein intake consumed three and a half servings of dairy per day, we observed a 33% reduction in fractures, a 46% reduction in hip fractures, an 11% reduction in falls. We slowed bone loss. We improved IGF-1 levels. Residents were able to maintain their nutritional status and also maintain the lean mass in their arms and legs. So in a sense, what we have done with the, just by providing additional dairy food, is that we've slowed the age-related increase in risk in all of these factors. And one of the points I always say is that malnutrition is not a normal part of ageing. And so we can see that um, the bone loss, the muscle loss, we were able to slow that simply by providing milk, yogurt and cheese. There has been some modelling done that looked at if we increase dairy consumption, the cost effectiveness of it. And you can see from the graph that the benefits were more pronounced in women in France because a greater proportion of those women had calcium intakes below um, 600 milligrams per day. If you look at the cost of dairy, it ranged between 0.4 to just under 0.7 euro. So the cost of the intervention that we did was around 0.5 euro per resident per day. So a relatively cheap intervention that proved to reduce falls and fractures. The cost of a hip fracture is divided um, between the acute setting, so during the hospital stay where the greatest burden of the cost is involved. Then we see there is a portion during the rehabilitation period, but more importantly there is additional cost to the aged care home in the year following the fracture, likely because the person may need more assistance and more time spent with them. So again, when we looked at the cost of the um, dairy food with this intervention, it was around um, 180 euro per resident per year. The benefit of any research is how we translate it into policy and practice. So for example, ensuring nutritional standards for food provision in aged care, um, education for staff, etc. One area of interest is when we look at the dietary recommendations for both calcium and dairy foods, they vary substantially around the world. So if we're to look at the line, we can see that the dietary recommendation for calcium in the UK is 700 milligrams in contrast to in Australia where it's 1300 milligrams. And also the serving sizes of dairy vary between different regions. So some common ground between these may ensure that we are providing enough dairy and enough calcium to minimise fracture risk in older adults. So in conclusion, dairy foods, namely milk, yogurt and cheese are important sources of calcium and protein amongst the other nutrients that they provide for older adults in care homes. And this is shown to reduce fractures, falls, weight loss and malnutrition risk. And these benefits are likely in other individuals with similar fracture risk profiles and levels of calcium and protein inadequacies. So with, with that, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to questions during the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you to Dr. Juliano for that fascinating presentation on a food-based intervention in the aged um, in Australia. And I think really we, we know that this is one of its kind. 
Um, I do want to encourage the audience or anyone attending, please to post your questions. You are welcome to post the questions that we can discuss later in our um, panel discussion. So please feel free to do that in the Q&A function. Great, then our next speaker is Dr. Emma Feeney from Ireland. Dr. Feeney holds degrees from Queen's University in Belfast, that's a BSc in genetics, and University College in Dublin, where she did her PhD in genetics and nutrition. She conducted postdoctoral training at University um, College Dublin and at the Pennsylvania State University in the areas of human nutrition and metabolism, functional food ingredients from dairy, and in sensory evaluation. Following research positions in FH1 phases one and two in human intervention studies and on the Healthy Cheeses work package, she joined the FHI management team as the science program manager in 2016. In 2017, she joined the faculty of the University College Dublin Institute of Food and Health. Dr. Feeney has extensive experience in various aspects of sensory evaluation, psychophysical measurements and nutrition intake assessments in children and adults. Her research interests include food consumption patterns, genetic variation in taste, and the subsequent effect on food liking and choice. Her presentation is titled, The Cheese Matrix, Impacts on Heart Health Outcomes. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on, on where you're joining from today. Uh, my name is Emma Feeney. I'm an assistant professor at UCD's Institute of Food and Health. And for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to speak to you about some work that we've done on the cheese matrix and impacts on heart health outcomes. And so I'd just like to start by saying thank you to the organisers for the invitation to speak to you all today and for the chance to disseminate some of this work. So thank you. And just to highlight my disclosures here. So we've heard already today from Dr. Halsher on the effects of the food matrix. And again here, I'd like to reiterate that point. So this diagram on the left uh, by Hoffman in 2003 shows how the different levels for studying diet and there are different levels on which we can study health. So we can study the overall diet itself, we can break it into, into different food groups, into food items, or we can look at the individual nutrients. When we study health, likewise, we have a number of levels as well. And with a reductionist approach, when we study the links between diet and health, often we are studying individual nutrients and their association with a single health biomarker. And we can lose then some of the important information on the links between diet and health. And this is particularly true for dairy foods. So dairy foods are well recognized for their nutrients and particularly calcium, which we know to be important for bone health. And again, this figure just really nicely demonstrates how when we focus on the links between the food constituents and the markers of intake, we can miss those true effects of diet and health. One of the important effects is the effect of the food matrix. And this figure by Aguilera in 2019 is a really nice overview of how the food matrix can result in differences in digestion and assimilation of nutrients. So if we look at the top left part of this figure, we can see that the nutrients are represented there by the black dots and they're present in the food in a particular matrix. And, uh, and that food has a particular microstructure. So the interaction of that food and the matrix in which it is eaten affects the bioaccessibility then of the nutrient and the bioavailability of the nutrient. So we can see that the food matrix in which a nutrient is consumed can affect the overall digestion and absorption of those nutrients. And this is just a really nice demonstration of food matrix effects. Okay, so now that we've you know, introduced that concept of the reductionist approach to the links between diet and health, and we've also talked about food matrix effects um, from different foods, 
I want to move on now and talk about a little bit about some of the, the evidence to date for different dairy products um, on different health outcomes. And so the figures that you can see here on this slide are from a recent meta-analysis by Jakobsen et al. in 2021. And you can see that they looked at a range of different dairy products um, and, and compared uh, their impact on different health outcomes. On this particular slide here, these ones were focused on coronary heart disease and risk of ischemic stroke. And so we can see um, that they've done two things. They've looked at milk overall, and you can see that on the left-hand side. And then over on the right-hand side, you can see that they've actually divided the milk out into low-fat milk and high-fat milk. And so we can also see uh, when we look at milk overall, um, there was really no, no effect. And you can see that that blue diamond at the bottom, which is an overall summary of the different studies, is very much in the middle of that risk ratio. But then if we look over on the right hand side, we can see actually that um, while low fat milk does appear to be neutral, when they divide them into low fat and high fat milk, we can see that actually with high fat milk, that blue diamond is falling to the right hand side of that line in the middle, which would indicate that there is a risk um, of high fat milk consumption and uh, increased risk of coronary heart disease and ischemic stroke. So the high fat milk did, see, uh, did show an association in this meta-analysis. Then if we look further at the risks, um, and this time considering for cheese consumption, we can see here that overall cheese was actually associated with a reduced risk of stroke, and it was slightly protective for coronary heart disease. But again, when they divided that out into low fat cheese, we can see that it was neutral overall, but there was a lot of heterogeneity in those results. So again, what this is demonstrating is you know, the importance of not just considering dairy foods as a whole, but considering those individual dairy products. And you know, this can be quite difficult sometimes to do with a lot of these studies because um, there's just a number of reasons. There's difficulties with the data. As we all know, food consumption data can be quite unreliable. Um, but also, it's not always collected in such a way to allow those individual foods to be examined. So for example, sometimes with food frequency questionnaires, uh, they tend to group all of the dairy foods together. It is interesting that we are consistently seeing cheeses as being um, beneficial or associated with a, a reduced risk of ischemic heart disease and stroke in so many of these studies now. Um, and one potential reason uh, for this may be due to the vitamin K content. So cheese is a source of vitamin K2. And um, you can see here that you know, it can be affected very much by a range of different factors that can affect K2 levels in cheese. So vitamin K2 has been associated with uh, decreased vascular calcification and so this is one potential hypothesis around why we, we see these um, continually these association studies that do suggest a reduced risk of coronary heart disease and ischemic stroke with cheese consumption. And so the key point that I want to make here is that dairy foods are not all the same and so really we shouldn't be treating them um, as a group as a whole whenever we look to those links between diet and health. And so this is just a really nice table from Thorning et al. in 2017 um, that just gives you a really clear overview of some of the key differences between, again, some generic um, different dairy products. So it has summarized cheese, two types of milk, yogurt, cream and butter. Again, this, this is a very simplistic overview. We know that you know, they differ even more than this. Um, but really what this is highlighting is that these different dairy products, they differ hugely in terms of their calcium and their phosphorus uh, content. They also differ hugely in terms of their protein content. So for example, cheeses will contain only casein, whereas some of the other dairy products will, will contain a mixture of whey and casein, and then cream and butter will have no protein in there. Um, the overall fat structure is quite different as well. So some of them, for example, are made from homogenized milk and they'll uh, be quite different then to products that have been made from non-homogenized milk. And then also the protein networks are very different as well. So even within cheese, cheeses can have a solid or a viscoelastic 
protein network, depending on whether it's a hard or a soft cheese. Uh, milk will have a liquid network, and then yogurts will have a gel or a viscoelastic network as well. So, so many um, structural differences there, fat content differences, and protein content differences as well. And so it makes sense then that these different dairy products can actually all result in quite different health effects. And again, there is quite a lot of evidence now for cheese as having beneficial effects, um, both on markers of heart health, as we've mentioned, and also on metabolic health. And it does seem as if some of these effects do appear to be due to the particular overall matrix of cheese itself. And so within UCD, we designed a study to test the effect of that cheese matrix and for this particular study we were interested in the effect of the saturated fat content on markers of heart health and how important it was that that fat should be maintained within the cheese matrix. So we conducted a study in an over 50s population, they had a BMI of 25 or over and um, we gave them 42 grams of fat in three different dairy matrices. So they either received all of their fat in the form of a full fat cheese, which you can see down at the bottom left, group A. Um, some of them received their fat in the form of a reduced fat cheese plus butter, and that's group B. And then group C received a broken down form. So it was their fat was, none of their fat was in the matrix of cheese. They were given butter, a calcium supplement, and they were also given a, a calcium caseinate powder. So we tried to match as closely as we could the fat, calcium, and the protein content. Um, and then also we had a fourth group of people who um, essentially followed the same diet as group A, a full fat cheese, but they first completed a six week run in where they removed all cheese from their diet before going on to the cheese diet. And so here you can see the results from that study. Um, on the left hand side, you can see the results for the total cholesterol. And then in the middle, you can see the HDL cholesterol and then on the right, that's the results for the LDL cholesterol. And on this bar chart, we have plotted the change from baseline. So we can see that there was a reduction overall in total cholesterol for groups A, B and C. Um, then the other two bars that you see are the two visits for group D. So the visit after they had removed all cheese from their diet, we see a small increase. And then once they had gone on to the same diet as group A, uh, we see that decrease then uh, after that six weeks. So overall, there was a decrease in total cholesterol. Um, no change really in the HDL cholesterol. You can see that in the middle. So if we look then on the right hand side, we can see that all of that change in total cholesterol was very much driven by changes in LDL cholesterol. And what I want to highlight here on, on these um, bars is that group A uh, had, had a significant reduction in their LDL cholesterol compared to groups B and C. So they experienced the greatest reduction in, in both total and LDL cholesterol was observed when, when the people consumed all of their fat within the matrix of cheese. And so more recently, we've done some work to look at those individual responses to those diets. Um, and this work has been led by our postdoc in our group, uh, Dr. Eileen O'Connor. And you can see on the left hand side here um, that there was considerable variation in the overall responses. So this is everyone's change plotted uh, in their total cholesterol. And you can see that it was possible then to, to group people into turtiles based on their individual response. And so Aileen grouped people into turtiles one, two, and three, um, just even, even groups uh, based on their overall response. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that we have plotted those turtiles of response uh, onto the different diets. So group A was the cheese diet, group B was the reduced fat cheese and butter diet, and then group C was the broken down form, so the butter and the calcium caseinate powder and the supplement. And what we can see here is that 
While there is definitely a food matrix effect, so we do see, for example, there in the full fat cheese group, we do see that, yes, those those people that are in that highest turtle of response, that more of them are in group A um, and in group B, and then there's much fewer of them in group C, which, which we would expect. But we do see that there is, that, you know, there are also people in group A who, who didn't respond or who went up in terms of their cholesterol. There's more of them in group C, um, but we do see we do see these differences across the groups. And so we wanted to try and identify then um, whether or not there were characteristics of people who would who would be what we would classify as a responder or not. So here then we can see that Aileen has compared the people in tertiles one and tertiles three for their baseline characteristics. And so on these two diagrams here on the left hand side, um, those people have been classified based on their change in their total cholesterol. And on the right hand side, they've been classified into tertiles based on their change in LDL cholesterol. So two slightly different uh, tertile groups there. But in both groups, what we can see is that there are significant differences at baseline between tertiles 1 and tertiles 3 for a range of fasting lipids. So total cholesterol, HDL and LDL were all different, um, as well as triacylglycerides. And so what this is telling us really is that um, those baseline levels as well are also very predictive of who will respond best to these high fat diets. So yes, there's certainly a food matrix effect where we did see that there was, a, there was a strong influence of the cheese matrix, but we also see that actually the people who might benefit the most from cheese um, are those people with those higher starting total and LDL cholesterol levels. But of course, um, as we now know as well, you know, fasting LDL and total cholesterol levels don't tell us the whole story. So within the LDL cholesterol, um, the particle size may actually be more indicative of the CVD risk than the LDL cholesterol level alone. And so here on this figure, this is just um, showing how two people could theoretically have the same overall level of LDL cholesterol, so both of these people have 130 milligrams per deciliter of LDL cholesterol, but you can see that it's held in very different particle sizes. And so this could be due to you know, a number of different reasons. It could be the fat quality rather than the quantity or, or the food matrix. It could be lots of different things um, that potentially affect these particle sizes. And so we were interested then to look into this in more detail as well. And so these figures then are showing um, some data from one of the PhD students in the group, Simone Dunn, who has been really focusing on the particle size and changes in particle size distribution from, from this same study. Um, I suppose not to go into these in a crazy amount of detail, but just I suppose to highlight that she has looked at uh, different particle sizes within the LDL particles. So she's divided them, she's looked at the total LDL particles and then she's divided them into large, intermediate um, and small LDL particles. And then I'll just show you on the next slide. And what she's saying then is that there is a very strong correlation between the changes in total uh, LDL particles and VLDL particles. So she sees this um, not only for the total population, but she sees it right across the different food matrices as well. And what these correlations are indicating then is a general move towards uh, less atherogenic profiles overall. So those changes are being driven by by movements towards a, a less atherogenic profile. So the, the changes in the, in the smallest particles are very, very strongly correlated, which indicates that those reductions that we see in the VLDL particles are driven by the smaller particles. And again, as I say, that's, that's quite similar actually for each of the diets. So we, we didn't see huge differences across the different food matrices there. So moving on then to try and understand a little bit um, 
you know, what might be driving some of these different effects that we see and what is it that's sort of special about the cheese matrix. We were quite interested in calcium um, and testing then the effect of changing calcium within a cheese matrix to see whether or not that might impact um, either LDL cholesterol levels or the primary objective of this study was to look at um, fecal fat excretion. And that's because there had been a few studies to suggest that the reason that we see some of these differences, because yeah, there have been a few studies now that show those differences between cheese and butter for, for fasting LDL cholesterol levels. And so some of the studies had suggested that this was due to differences in fecal fat excretion that could be driven by the calcium content of cheese. So within this study, we, um, we had some specially made cheeses by our colleagues down in Chagask. And they, they basically just, during the process of making natural cheese, they naturally reduced down the calcium content of some of the cheese, uh, of one cheese, and they naturally increased the calcium content of another cheese. So we had a reduced calcium cheese of 555 milligrams per 100 grams of cheese. Um, and then we had a high calcium cheese, and so that cheese contained 897 milligrams of calcium per 100 grams of cheese. And then we had a control group who also were given the reduced calcium cheese and a calcium supplement to bring them up to the same overall amount of calcium as that high calcium cheese diet. And so this table is just an overview of, of those uh, compositions in total. And we're showing it here for 100 gram portions, but we actually gave people 240 grams of cheese a day for two weeks in this study. So here you can see just a really brief overview of the overall design for that calcium study. So the volunteers, um, we had in total, we had seven people who completed the study in total. We were aiming for 10, but it was quite difficult to get people to stay in the study. And then also uh, we weren't able to recruit further people afterwards because of the fact that the cheeses had been specially made and matured for this study. Um, but you can see that they spent two weeks uh, on a high calcium cheese. They spent two weeks on a low calcium cheese and they also spent two weeks on a low calcium cheese plus the calcium supplement. All of their other food was given to them for the, during the course of this study. Um, and they completed a five day fecal collection during each of those periods. And they also completed a 24 hour urine collection as well. And, uh, and, and these, um, the, the dietary periods were randomized as well. So the results of that study were, were published recently in the European Journal of Nutrition. And here you can see that our primary outcome, which was uh, fecal fat excretion, that we didn't actually see differences in the fecal fat excretion in terms of uh, when it was expressed as grams per day. Now we did see differences in the fecal fat excretion when it was expressed as a percentage, um, but the, it was actually the reduced calcium cheese plus the supplement group who had the highest fecal fat percentage uh, there. What we didn't expect to see was that we actually saw a reduction in LDL cholesterol. Um, so post-intervention, fasting LDL cholesterol was lower in the high calcium cheese group compared to the other two arms of the study. Um, and we weren't expecting to see that at all because they were really they were only on the uh, interventions for two weeks and they were young, healthy males as well. So, so that was an unexpected result. Um, it does potentially point to, you know, something else in the matrix uh, since the calcium excretion was actually higher after the calcium supplement group. Um, it didn't appear to be supported by the fecal fat excretion results, although I should point out here that we did only have seven people who completed that study. And again, that was just due to quite high dropout rates um, and it wasn't possible to recruit further people to the study because of the fact that, that those cheeses were specifically made. Um, but again, it does appear to point to a specific matrix effect for cheese. And so again, this is something that we would like to look into a little bit further at some point in the future. And so here on the left hand side, you can see a figure where we've really just tried to pull together some of those different um, effects within the cheese matrix that may be leading to some of these differences that we see. 
So we can see here some of the different factors that affect how the cheese matrix is digested and absorbed from the initial processing conditions, so the milk composition, the pretreatment, the manufacturing process, the ripening, right through to the food preparation, to oral processing, and then through to digestion and absorption. And again, so coming back then to this link between diet and health, you know, it is important as we continue to look at you know, some of the, the different products and their links to health outcomes. Um, it is important that I suppose, first of all, that we do collect that information and to the level that we need. Um, but also we do want to try and understand more about how that preparation process before consumption can actually impact health as well. So we actually have, have a study that's just finishing up at the moment um, where we've been looking at the effect of melting cheese before consumption to see if that is something that will also impact that overall food matrix and some of those food matrix effects that we see from cheese as well. So thank you very much for listening and also thank you to the people listed here, the cheese study team and the wider FHI team and our past cheese study member team members as well. Um, I'd be more than happy to chat to any of you about any of these studies if you'd like any more information on them. My email address is there. Um, and then finally, just uh, thank you so much to the organisers for the opportunity to speak to you all today and to disseminate this work. Thank you. So thank you very, very much to Dr. Feeney for the fascinating results related to cheese and heart health that they have seen in the cheese studies. And um, Dr. Feeney will not be joining us in the panel discussion, so please do make use of her offer to email any questions. You can also add your questions in the Q&A because our other panelists will also be able to answer questions related to, to cheese intake. Um, then I'm going to introduce our final speaker, and that's Dr. Andre Marit from Canada. Dr. Marit is a full professor at the Faculty of Medicine of Laval University in Quebec, Canada. He's a researcher at the Quebec Heart and Lung Institute and at the Institute of Nutrition and Functional Foods. And he holds a research chair in the pathogenesis of insulin resistance and cardiovascular disease. Dr. Marit's work focuses on the causes of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, and the treatment of those pathologies. In particular, he's studying the role of intestinal microbiota in the pathogenesis of these diseases and developing treatment strategies for them based on this knowledge. Dr. Marit has published more than 300 articles, literature reviews, and book chapters. He's the recipient of numerous honors, including the University of Toronto's prestigious Charles Best Lectureship Award. He was the editor-in-chief of the prestigious scientific journal, American Journal of um, Physiology, Endocrinology and Metabolism from 2016 to 2022. And he has authored two books, one for the general public titled um, The Truth About Sugar, in French and a scientific textbook entitled Yogurt, Roles in Nutrition and Impacts on Health. So his talk today is titled Yogurt and Type 2 Diabetes. Well, I'd like to first thank the organizers for the opportunity to present at this meeting. My name is André Marette. I'm a researcher at Laval University. And today I'm going to talk about new mechanisms by which yogurt intake may reduce the incidence of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and fatty liver disease. I've been working uh, a long time on the mechanisms of insulin resistance uh, leading to type 2 diabetes. And of course, uh, this is well known now to be associated with uh, fat cell hypertrophy, this metabolic inflammation developing into the adipose tissue, eventually spreading to the liver and skeletal muscle. Inflammation is also known to spread to other tissues, cardiovascular tissues, and even the beta cells and the pancreas, leading to type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Uh, we came to realize many uh, years ago that the intestine or the gut is also very important 
Of course, the gut uh, produces hormones and neurofactors that are important to regulate uh, metabolic uh, homeostasis, uh, but also the gut is um, an important barrier to bacteria and bacterial products. And if that barrier is uh, leaky, which we call gut leakiness, then it favors the, uh, the, the, the appearance in the circulation of LPS and other uh, inflammatory molecules, and that creates metabolic inflammation. Of course, uh, I'm going to talk today about the microbiota because the microbiota or dysbiosis of this microbiota can favor the development of metabolic inflammation by favoring uh, gut leakiness. So we've been working on different food factors uh, that are known to uh, regulate the gut microbiota. And today I'm going to focus on fermented dairy products because of course this is the topic of my presentation. What about fermented dairy products? First of all, uh, there's a lot of systematic reviews, meta-analysis that have shown clearly that in general dairy products, uh, the intake of dairy products is at least neutral or even favorable in order to reduce the incidence of cardiovascular related clinical outcomes. And for example, in this uh, uh, publication by Drouin Chartier et al. in 2016, when you actually review all the literature looking at the association between the intake of dairy product and clinical outcomes, what appears to be very, very clear is that yogurt intake is associated with a favorable outcome, meaning less incidence of type 2 diabetes, and the association is very strong, very high. So why would uh, yogurt intake reduce uh, in, uh, the incidence of type 2 diabetes? So several years ago, we started a collaboration with Dano Nutricia, and those two individuals, Noemi Daniel and René Tonashbar in my lab, uh, were uh, involved in this. They are the first uh, two co-first authors of this paper. And their work was to uh, determine the effect of yogurt intake on the whole body and tissue-specific insulin resistance in a new model of type 2 diabetes uh, that we have developed. And this is a mouse model. I'm going to show you the details soon. And, uh, of course, they wanted to look at the potential role of the gut microbiota and specific metaboli metabolites in yogurt that could explain its health effects. So we designed, uh, together with Danone, uh, this, uh, these diets for these animals. We had three groups of animals. We had controlled animals on a low-fat, low-sucrose uh, diet, high-fat, high-sucrose diet-fed animals, and some of those animals were also treated with yogurt. So this was a prevention trial in the animals. And we had three diets. We had the, um, the low-fat, low-sucrose, I fat I sucrose, and in this particular diet, we introduced the uh, LYP. LYP is a lyophilized yogurt product uh, because it allows us to concentrate the product and put it in the diet. So the diet of these animals here uh, contain uh, the, the yogurt product, which allowed us to uh, to uh, give the animals the equivalent of about two portions of yogurt per day, which is in humans uh, what is needed to see some beneficial effect based on meta-analysis. So we, uh, we kept these animals for 12 weeks on the diet. Uh, we did three different studies, and at the end we could pull the analysis and looking at the effect of uh, the yogurt treatment on metabolic homeostasis and liver uh, disease. So this is the results of the pool analysis of all these studies. So the uh, the numbers of animals is about 80 here. It's very, very high because we pulled the analysis. And you can see that as compared to control animals, the eye fat feeding produced an increase in body weight. And this was slightly but significantly reduced uh, by the yogurt treatment. And this is probably linked to a small reduction of food intake or energy intake in these animals. So. If you do individual studies, you, you won't be able to see this very small effect. But if you combine uh, the studies from three batches, you actually see a significant effect. But even more uh, striking is the fact that our new diet, uh, which is containing different type of protein, is really increasing fasting glucose. So these animals are diabetic, but this, uh, this effect is reduced in animals treated with yogurt. And fasting insulin, fasting hyperinsulinemia is also prevented to some extent by yogurt treatment. And when you actually look at the uh, OMA index, which is an index of insulin resistance, you can see that the yogurt treatment for the time of the uh, experiment was able to reduce insulin resistance.
Now, this is the uh, individual uh, study uh, data for glucose tolerance. So you see the glucose tolerance of the animals on the high fat fed diet is really uh, exacerbated as compared to control animals. The yogurt effect is very small. It's not significant on glucose tolerance. But when you actually look at the insulin release during the glucose tolerance, you see a major reduction in the uh, amount of insulin that is released. And this is uh, really the beta cell release of the insulin that is reduced because C-peptide levels are also reduced in these animals. So to confirm that this was an improvement of insulin sensitivity in these animals, we perform hyperinsulinemic or glycemic clamps. So the amount of glucose that is disposed during the test is reflects the insulin sensitivity of the animal. Obviously, the control animals on low fat, low sucrose are very insulin sensitive, but the animals on the high fat diet are clearly insulin resistant. And those that were also treated with yogurt, as you can see, yogurt prevented about 10 to 15 percent, so an improvement of about 10, 15 percent of glucose disposal during the clamp. So all body insulin sensitivity is improved, but during the clamp, we also use a 3 d of glucose to look at glucose turnover, measuring both RA, or hepatic glucose production, and RD, which is peripheral glucose uptake. And as you can see in the high fat fed animals, the ability of insulin during the clamp to reduce glucose production or to stimulate glucose uptake was markedly altered. This is denoting uh, insulin resistance in both the liver and the muscle. And when you treat with yogurt, the animals that uh, also consume yogurt, they have a slight improvement of a hepatic insulin sensitivity, as shown here, but also the the, the lack of glucose uptake uh, during the clamp that was seen in the high fat fed animals uh, was improved in the animals treated with yogurt. So suggesting, indicating that insulin sensitivity in both the liver and muscle was improved by yogurt treatment. Very strikingly as well, when we start looking at liver uh, in, in more detail, this is the histology of liver, you can see that the amount of lipids in the liver is of course increased by feeding a high fat, high sucrose diet. This is the liver weight, but this is, uh, when you look at liver weight, you look at glycogen and water, not only lipids. So if you measure lipid triglycerides, you see that there is clearly hepatic steatosis in the high fat fed animals. But the yogurt treatment, particularly on lipid accumulation, uh, really uh, reduce hepatic steatosis in these animals. You can see that at the histology. And we had uh, two pathologists that looked at these slides independently and blindly, and they confirmed that this was associated also with the reduction of uh, signs of NASH and NAFLD when uh, animals were treated with yogurt as compared to no yogurt treatment. We then look at the gut microbiota because our hypothesis was that yogurt uh, increases or improve metabolic homeostasis to change in the gut microbiota. And so these are the three independent studies comparing here the uh, control versus high fat fed animals. Uh, and you see that there's a lot of change. So red denotes a reduction of bacteria, a different species of bacteria, or I should say genera. And in, in green, you have the increase in some species. So, uh, of course, there's a lot of change with high fat feeding. But what is more interesting is when you start comparing the yogurt versus the high fat fed animals. These animals are exactly the same diet, except, of course, that some of the protein, uh, especially, was replaced by the yogurt uh, treatment. And as you can see, some bacteria, like the streptococcus, was increased by yogurt treatment. This is probably one of the starting bacteria that was present in the yogurt. Uh, you see osteobacter that seems also to be increased, at least in two studies. And then the most striking results was this one. This peptostreptococci uh, was clearly downregulated by yogurt treatment in all the different studies that we did. It's a non-culture bacteria. We don't know yet what it is exactly. We're looking into it right now, but it's very interesting. But not only at the taxonomic level did we see an impact. When we start looking at bile acids, and we look at several uh, type of bile acids uh, in this particular project. And one very interesting one is HDCA because this is associated with reduced hepatic steatosis in mice and improvement in blood glucose and LDL receptor knockout mice. And a decrease in this particular bile acid was reported as the main bile acid alteration in the rat model of hypertensive in AFLD. And this particular bile acid was actually reduced by high fat feeding in both protocols where we looked at bile acids, and this was partly prevented, this loss was pre partly prevented by 
uh, yogurt treatment, which is kind of interesting. It might maybe explain some of the effect we have seen on the gut microbiota. Now, to demonstrate the causal effect of the microbiome into uh, the yogurt effect, we transferred the gut microbiota from animals treated with uh, the high-fat diet plus or minus yogurt to germ-free mice, producing mice colonized with the microbiota from these different groups. And when we look at uh, the impact of these uh, microbiota transfer to these animals, what we notice is that even if it's a smaller number of animals and only nine weeks of treatment or follow-up after the, uh, the, uh, the transplantation, what we found is that already glucose seems to be a little bit improved by yogurt treatment, but not significantly. Not by yogurt treatment, of course, by the transfer the gut microbiota from yogurt-treated animals. But clearly the fecal microbiota transplantation was able to improve fasting insulin and the OMA ER was almost significantly different in these animals. And when we look at glucose tolerance, we saw no difference between the two groups as we've seen with yogurt treatment. But when we actually look at the, uh, the insulin release during the test, we found out that, that those animals that were transferred to microbiota from yogurt treated animals had actually lower insulinemia throughout the process. So this shows that some of the benefits of yogurt treatment were actually carried out for, or explained by changing the gut microbiota. Next, we wanted to compare the, uh, the yogurt and liver metabolomes. Uh, in order to try to reveal new markers of yogurt artifacts. So when we look at the liver metabolomes of these animals, we identified 35 metabolites that were differently abundant to the liver, uh, liver of yogurt-treated animals versus non-yogurt-treated controls. And six of these metabolites were also increased in yogurt uh, as compared to milk and were over represented in the liver of yogurt treated high fat fed mice. So we thought these might be very interesting metabolites. And I'm gonna focus on three of these metabolites here, uh, which are ICA, HMVA, and IVA. These are hydroxylated metabolites of branch chain amino acids. So leucine, azoleucine, and valine uh, can be metabolized to ICA, HMVA, and IVA. So we thought these were quite interesting uh, findings. and. Just to give you some ideas about the potential of these metabolites to maybe play a role into the metabolic benefits of yogurt treatment. Uh, when you actually look uh, at the levels of these molecules, so this is the level of these molecules in the liver, uh, in uh, the animals which are on the control diet, and the animals on the high fat fed diet actually had lower levels of these metabolites and yogurt treatment as expected because yogurt contains these metabolites was able to reverse partly or almost fully uh, as compared to animals non-treated with yogurt this was measured by uh, UPSC MSMS we also confirmed these uh, results by LC MSMS uh, as you can see the reduction in the liver with the high fat feeding partial prevention by treatment with yogurt and these animals. But interestingly, these changes were also seen in skeletal muscle, especially for HMVA and IVA. So reduction by obesity and prevention by yogurt treatment. And even in the plasma, BCHA are detectable in the circulation of these animals. And again, uh, obesity or high fat feeding reduces the level of these metabolites, but this can be partially prevented by yogurt treatment. When you actually use NMR to quantify these uh, metabolites better, you see the different distribution uh, of these three different molecules in the circulation. Again, these molecules are not present in milk. They are present in yogurt. And this, this, uh, is, this is the measurement of these metabolites in the three different yogurt produce, uh, yogurt product we use for the three studies. Now, very interestingly, uh, these metabolites of brain chain amino acids are associated with changes in both blood glucose, fasting blood glucose, as well as hepatic triglycerides. You can see that there's a negative relationship between the abundance of these uh, different metabolites and hepatic steatosis and type 2 diabetes, suggesting that uh, that these uh, metabolites are, are associated with the health benefits of yogurt treatment. And to uh, determine whether these metabolites are bioactive, we uh, done some studies uh, in uh, FAO hepatocytes looking at liver glucose production. 
And we uh, confirmed that these BCHA are cell autonomous modulators of liver metabolism. Uh, this is hepatic glucose production measured in the basal condition or the insulin suppressed condition. Of course, insulin per se is able to suppress glucose production. But you can see there's a dose dependent effect of uh, these three uh, BCHA to reduce hepatic glucose production, especially in the presence of insulin. Also, you can show individual effect of these uh, BCHA. For example, ICA is able to reduce hepatic glucose production, again, both in the basal, in the ins insulin stimulated or suppressed state. Uh, leucine, which is a precursor of ICA, is not able to do that. So it's really specific for the hydroxylated metabolites of BCAA. And when you combine leucine and ICA, you don't see any change, meaning that leucine cannot interfere with the ability of ICA to reduce glucose production. So this paper was recently published in Nature Communication, again, the work of Noemi and Rato, but also several individuals in my lab and at Dano Nutritional Research. And uh, what we are currently doing is trying to understanding um, how this uh, yogurt treatment can actually replenish or restore BCHA levels. So it, it's possible, of course, that by providing BCHA directly into, to the system, this is explaining why the liver contains more BCHA after yogurt treatment, but it's also possible that change in the gut microbiota conferred by yogurt treatment is helping to metabolize BCAA into BCHA and therefore helping the liver to contain more of these metabolites. So we're currently looking also at different species of bacteria that could be contained or, or added to yogurt in order to increase BCHA content in different type of livers uh, of yogurt. Finally, some, uh, some, a few words about humans. Is this only a phenomenon in mice? Uh, we don't believe it's the case because when, uh, in, in collaboration with Claude Zagagnon at, at our research center, we started to look at the level of these uh, branch chain hydroxy acids in human plasma. And as you can see, they are detectable. We can detect all of them. Uh, I'm going to show you only one example, ICA. So we're looking here at the ICA level in obese individuals. These are um, uh, massively obese, severely obese individuals. You see the BMI 40 here. So these are undergoing surgery, uh, of course. And we have here the obese uh, type 2 diabetes individuals. So the only difference between these two, they were matched for age and sex and weight. But uh, one group is hyperglycemic, the other one is not. So the, the obese uh, diabetic individuals had almost significantly lower amounts of ICA in their circulation. That's only looking at eight or nine individuals. So uh, this is very preliminary, but it suggests it's, it's, it's the case that these metabolites are reduced in type 2 diabetes. And when you actually look at the ICA leucine ratio, to, to have a kind of a point of view about the biosynthetic pathway leading to the production of these metabolites, you see that the tendency is even stronger for a reduction. So we're currently looking at hundreds of, of people in order to increase the N and, and to look at this more properly, but these uh, very preliminary studies are quite uh, interesting. So I'll stop here and I'd like to thank Noemi, Renato, and several members of my lab for this uh, this study. Uh, and of course, my colleagues at Laval University who were involved in this project. And of course, my colleagues at Dano Nutrition Research, especially Adna Kutnikova and her team, our, our collaborators, several peoples were involved also in, uh, you know, providing the yogurt product that we use for this study. I'd like to thank CIHR for funding, as well as Dano Nutrition for funding, especially Patrick Vega and Liliana Jimenev for uh, funding this project. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer questions. So thank you very much to all our speakers for preparing these insightful and engaging presentations about important aspects of dairy whole foods and health. We now move over to our panel discussion, and I invite the speakers that are present, in per that have been able to join in person, to turn on your videos. Thank you very much. So today we have with us Dr. Luigi Ricardiello and Dr. Sandra Giuliano. Thank you. You can see them also on the screen now. So we're looking forward to our discussion for the next 20 minutes or so. And then also thank you to the attendees for, for posting your questions and we'll do the best we can to get through them in the remaining time.
Okay, so in terms of how this will work, I thought to pose a question, and if it is directed to a specific expert, please feel free to answer. If it's a general question, you can just um, uh, answer as you would like. So a, a lot of the questions that were posted may not be directly linked to these two presentations. And I know that we have had um, uh, the email addresses of some of the other panelists listed in the um, at the end of their presentations, and I'm sure that we can share those with everyone as well. Right, so I'm going to start with the first question that came through on the Q&A. And um, I think, uh, Dr. Ricardiello, if you can perhaps answer this one for us, it's related to how, how high calcium can increase the removal of fat in feces, if you have any idea on the mechanisms that may be involved there. Well, this is actually a difficult question to be answered, but you know there are studies ongoing trying to understand how uh, calcium works. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I think I was very fascinated by the first uh, speaker question that um, uh, first speaker presentation uh, who really addressed the issue of calcium uh, is really, calcium availability is really uh, in relation to the matrix. And this is something that I think is is very critical to uh, to pinpoint and and start and study further. And this is also important, uh, uh, in a sense, to uh, uh, try to understand how this is changing the gut microbiome. Um, we are always focused on calcium. But we have to think about that. Milk has several other uh, important components that we are kind of neglecting. Uh, and, uh, and so in my opinion, I think we have to approach our preventive medicine and I've been working on colorectal cancer by looking at the interaction of these components. Um, the latest data on the EPIC study clearly shows that it's not just, you know, uh, um, you know, the daily products, but also vitamin B2 that is uh, providing a protective effect uh, uh, vitamin B12. Uh, so we, we, we have to really uh, look at this as a more holistic. Of course, we can uh, try to understand how calcium in the, in the stools uh, are then, you know, uh, fun, and, you know uh, the, through metabolism can be modulated. But in my opinion, we have to move a little bit beyond that. Great, thank you. I think that's a great answer because today we are focusing on the matrix and we realize that the whole is much more than the sum of the parts. So thank you for that answer. Sandra, I'm going to ask you something now. Um, the, uh, um, there was a question about the role of dairy in bone strength. So could you perhaps... Um, reply on any studies that might not have been in your study where you had a look at bone strength in older adults specifically? Are you aware of anything that has been done in this field? Yeah, no, I, I have and I have answered, I will answer it properly, um, but there, there are no randomised controlled trials mm -hmm. in adulthood, but what there are is there are a few cross-sectional studies that have looked at associations between dairy intake and bone strength. And I think one offhand is in males. So, but in terms of randomized controlled trials, no. Okay. Um, I'm going to follow that up with another question. Um, 3.5 servings of dairy in older adults with an inadequate intake showed very beneficial effects in your study. Um, but how low was the intake to begin with? In our, this sample of people, it averaged about two servings per day, but our prior work has showed anything between one and two servings daily. Okay, so it, it was an inadequate intake to start off with. Yes. And no differences in the two groups at base No. Line? Yeah, no, it was fairly similar. Um, it was about two servings um, per person per day what we find is 
one serving um, in Australian aged care, they drink a lot of tea and coffee, and that's often used. So they may have six to eight cups per day. And we actually observe that often the intake is simply the milk added to those teas and coffees mm. in place of an actual serving of dairy itself. Okay. And um, one attendee also asked um, whether the study has been published and whether they could have access to their publication. Are you still in the process of publishing it? No, it is published. And what I will do okay. is I'll answer that question. Um, I have the link and I'll actually put it in the, um, the Q&A answer box for them. Okay, that'll be very helpful. Thank you very, very much. Welcome. Right. Um, I'm going to move back to Dr. Ricardiello and ask, um, you now work in colorectal cancer. Perhaps if you can give some insights on any evidence uh, for dairy in terms of other cancers? Well, there are, you know, the uh, information about uh, dairy is coming also from uh, studies on prostate cancer, on lung, ga on lung cancer. You know, the interesting thing is that initial works uh, uh, many years back were kind of, uh, uh, you know, associating, uh, uh, you know, the use of dairy products, in particular cheese, with the increased risk of, uh, of uh, uh, some type of cancers. But there is overwhelming uh, information that dairy products are protective. Uh, we are, now we are understanding more and more the process that is actually linking dairy products to protection. Uh, of course, uh, the boosting research on microbiome has uh, really uh, uh, been a game changer in not only understanding the physiological mechanisms, but also looking at specific molecular mechanisms that are uh, linking uh, dairy products towards you know, protection uh, uh, from, from getting cancer. Uh, in my opinion, I think we are on the right way, uh, right, we are following the right path uh, because uh, um, uh, the, the studies are now more committed to uh, not pinpointing to uh, a single uh, uh, compounds, but really working on, uh, uh, on the dietary, uh, you know, uh, complexity of, of uh, dairy products. Uh, we have done several studies uh, on colorectal cancer, but not on dairy products, uh, on, uh, uh, you know, polyphenols. Uh, and if you use all extracts, uh, as opposed to the single polyphenol, you have completely different results. Meaning that you have to, especially in animal models, you have to boost the concentration of the single compound, uh, which actually could have a detrimental effect. So uh, we were able to demonstrate that by using all assets, for example, from fruits or vegetables, uh, you have a very protective effect, uh, which is also coming from the synergistic, uh, uh, you know, uh, effect from many compounds that are boosting each other. And so this is something that I really think uh, um, is important. We are on the right path, uh, trying to understand more and more how dairy products, you know, work in terms of cancer prevention. And uh, I think this is uh, something we will have more uh, more interesting information about this. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Juliana, I was also wondering, you mentioned at the beginning um, that the prevalence of fractures in the aged in aged care facilities was much higher than their community peers. Any ideas why this may be? Look, often people enter aged care because they have high falls risk. So therefore you find that you have a group of people that have um, a high propensity to falling. And from our data, all but one of the fractures occurred from a fall. So the, the fact is that they are repeated fallers. Um, we mm. observed 23,000 falls over that two year period. So on average, that's about three falls per person. You also mentioned that um, mortality was more or less the same for the participants in the two groups, but it seemed to me that there was a specific impact on quality of life. So, you know, maybe not extending life, but improving quality of life. 
Um, and you, you, you also mentioned muscle mass, not only bone health. Um, do you think that addressing sarcopenia could, could, could have been a, a reason why, why we saw that um, improvement as well? It is likely that the um, maintenance of the muscle mass in the arms and legs may have contributed to the lower number of falls because um, ideally if they maintain muscle mass in their legs, they're able to hopefully ambulate more safely. Um, also, their malnutrition increased in the controls and we know that malnutrition itself is a risk factor for falling. So I think it was a few factors that may have contributed to the lower falls that resulted in lower fractures. Okay. But also I really think it's an important outcome of your study that improved quality of life seemed to be present in those participants that had the diet, higher dairy intake. Yeah, they did. We actually had quality of life measures, but what we found oh. in this cohort is that the attrition is extremely high. Their, their starting age is 87. So over a two-year period, you'd have lost 40% of your residents. Mm -hmm. So although we had enough power to detect differences in quality of life initially because of the high rates of mortality and also the high rates of cognitive decline, um, the, the data was robust enough to actually use measures that we could then compare to other studies around the world. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so a number of the other questions were related to the presentations of um, presenters that cannot join us today. So I'm going to go over to another general question that I'd like to pose to our two panelists that are with us today in terms of the matrix in general. And I'd like to know, how do you think policy needs to evolve to consider the shift from a nutrient base to a whole food approach? Any takers? <laughs> Start, <laughs> and I'm happy to talk as well, but yes. I think definitely this is something that needs to be pursued. Um, and and uh, uh, I think the industry uh, and together policymakers need to work together, uh, trying to to bring a shift of this is a, a shift of paradigm. I mean, we have to uh, really work on that, uh, and uh, I'm very much in favor to that. Mm. Um, we in Australia. Australia, we actually have. Um, dietary recommendations for food servings so dairy is considered a food group and we have the food servings which is then food based so it's our requirement for this older adult is four servings per day for women three and a half for men so if we go with just that food approach and not look at the the nutrients that they contain by default they will receive nutrient nutrient adequacy so if they're consuming the right the right number of whole grain cereals, um, you know, meats from the meat group, dairy, fruits and vegetables, they will inherently be have sufficient nutrient intake. So I think if we I agree, if we move away from just a nutrient, because the good, biggest fear is that we can obtain those nutrients from a tablet, but what we miss then is all the other components of that food, some of which we don't understand. And it's that combination or that matrix which often makes the food better than if we were to take out all the individual nutrients from that food. So I agree, we need to go back to what we do. We eat food. We don't eat nutrients. Mm -hmm. And that's what needs to be emphasised in our guidelines as well. Okay. So in terms of developing guidelines, our food-based guidelines, those are more important than nutrient intake guidelines. Okay, any additions from your side? Well, it, you know, I, I showed one paper um, which was actually published and very well, uh, um, you know, uh, a, there was a lot of discussion about that paper in, in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which actually uh, randomized the supplement of calcium uh, uh, as opposed to placebo to patients with high risk of recurrent of adenomas. 
And people think, you know, that supplemental calcium can really, uh, you know, prevent. Uh, uh, that was actually our knowledge uh, that supplemental calcium might be, you know, uh, important uh, uh, in terms of preventing cancer. But we have to move from the supplemental thought. Of course, supplements are important, uh, but as we are recognizing more and more, uh, you know, food uh, as a complex in its complexity is really something that is uh, providing the beneficial effect in terms of uh, uh, disease prevention uh, uh, and also can, can work towards treatment uh, again, because when, when you have a cancer patient and you have you know, uh, the right diet, uh, uh, the patient does better. And, uh, and this is something that has been demonstrated. So I think we have to work with the policymakers, uh, and this is something that goes back also to the public, um, uh, trying to make everybody understanding that uh, food is is important, uh, more important than the single, you know, uh, uh, nutrient and uh, micronutrient that we would uh, find there. Okay, I see in the Q and A um, comments and questions that there's quite a lot of questions about. We talk about yogurt. So, what are we? Is there a difference between sweetened versus unsweetened or dairy products in terms of lower fat and higher fat? So, would you still personalize these recommendations for different um, patients, or are we going with a, a general recommendation for all? So, uh, some I, patients, uh, I, I can here? I can tell you from from the evidence. Uh, there are especially, I, I mean, if you look at the data on, uh, on milk and coronal cancer, uh, you know, there were no differences uh, when considering skim milk to whole milk uh, in terms of protection. And uh, for yogurt, uh, I mean, that was not uh, taken into consideration in terms of uh, artificial sweeteners or, you know, uh, sweetened yogurt. Uh, so I, I, as it stands right now, I wouldn't go with uh, making differences because the evidence is not being completely explored. But I think many studies will come, you know, uh, for will be done uh, in the future, which will uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, um, clarify whether there are specific, you know, uh, changes or or differences based on. Uh, different settings. So, in my opinion, right now we can we can have just a generalized uh, information. Um, Dr. Juliana, your opinion? Yes. So, in Australia, our recommendations were always to, and I think America is the same, to choose low-fat versions of foods. Mm -hmm. But they're now changing that, and now mm -hmm. they're suggesting just regular or any type, so you don't have to preferentially have low-fat. The the rationale for that was the consideration that the high saturated fat content may have an effect on serum lipids and cardiovascular disease. But a lot of the data in randomized controlled trials have actually shown no effect on um, serum cholesterol levels, and some have actually shown a beneficial effect. And those ones, interestingly, are always the ones that have used cheese and yogurt and have shown beneficial effects or no effects. So they're starting to look at the evidence and say the concept of low, low fat or reduced fat dairy is not is not based on good science. And the science is suggesting that any type. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in the aged care setting where I work, um, it's they generally use whole fat because one of the considerations is we've got to look at total energy intake as well. And we need to ensure that in a given amount of food that can be consumed, that they're getting the nutrients as well as the total energy. So they're using, um, rarely are they using reduced fat in older adults in that setting. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So we, we're talking about um, the foods. On the other side, when looking at um, biomarkers, we saw the difference between in particle size with LDL cholesterol making a significant difference. Do you think that we should be considering different biomarkers going forward? Do you think that this is a field that will be developing as we go forward? Um, uh, 
Maybe the Sandra wants there. to answer first and then... Well, you know, I think, I think what we're doing is we're complicating it. We're complicating food. We're making food, um, you know, a science. Food is food. And I think, as I mentioned before, often we don't understand the matrix aspect of it. We don't understand we've got different fatty acid um, composition in a dairy food and we're trying to pull it apart whereas I'm just I think we go back to that whole food I think we're complicating it we need to look at the whole food and look at the total effect because my fear is always that people will then go and extract try to extract the component that they feel is the beneficial component and then compartmentalize it and then market that as the answer to a problem bring it back to food Okay, thank you. Anything from your side, Dr. Ricardiello? I totally agree with Sandra. I think in uh, I, I think there is a lot of research, of course, in uh, uh, in this field and uh, looking at possible biomarkers. I think more will come from uh, metabolomics, for example, in the future. Mm. There is a lot of research there. Uh, but again, uh, um, I think we are just starting. Uh, because again, we were working a lot on the different components, uh, calcium, mm -hmm. folate, uh, you know, uh, vitamin B12, vitamin B2. Uh, and now it's more complicated because we have to look at, you know, the effect of all food on, uh, uh, you know, um, physiological mechanisms uh, and time to pathological mechanisms. I think we need to to explore, you know, uh, more biomarkers and probably metabolomics is something that will uh, will help us. Thank you. Right, I'm going to ask if you have any final comments that you'd like to make before I go over to closing today's symposium. Please go ahead. Yes, I I just want to go back to what Sandra was saying about low fat and high fat, and uh, which doesn't make difference. I think people need to focus now away from dairy to things that are really driving the population to uh, becoming more obese. Uh, as I was mentioning during my presentation, we have a huge problem, which is registered in the United States. We are registering also in Europe, but is registered worldwide, which is uh, cancers that are occurring below the age of 50. And this is something that is ramping up quite substantially, very, very, you know, it's like uh, uh, approximately 5% every year uh, in terms of increased uh, incidence uh, between the age of 20 and 29 in the United States. So in the past, you know, 30 years has been increased, uh, increasing by 125%. And this is something that is totally in relation or most likely totally in relation to early onset obesity. And, and so we have to really um, not demonize certain things like mm -hmm. milk and dairy products. So we need probably to work more on sweetened uh, you know, drinks, uh, uh, no physical activity in our kids. Mm -hmm. And probably the future studies on dairy should be, should focus also on this population from uh, early age, adolescent through adult to the weather, those who are consuming, uh, you know, dairy products are more protected towards, uh, you know, cancer development or metabolic syndrome. We have seen this in, uh, we, we can, uh, as you, you saw from the last speaker, you can contrast the effect of obesity by providing or metabolic syndrome by providing dairy products. And this is probably something that needs to be explored. The policy Thank makers you, need you. to focus on things that are leading to obesity in our population and not demonizing others. Most of the Thank you. saturated yeah, most of the saturated fat intake is coming from processed foods, not dairy. So it, mm -hmm. it's difficult to blame dairy food for increasing saturated fat intake when most of it's coming from non-dairy sources. And I agree, we have to. Um, we actually have to address the whole lifestyle and the change in lifestyle that we're seeing over the last, you know, decade or more. And um, I think one of the key is the low physical activity. 
I think that's mm. probably a major determinant of the obesity and the change and plus the changes in eating patterns. Thank you so much for joining in the panel discussion. Your contribution is appreciated very much and I found it very thought provoking and I, I'm sure all our attendees did as well. Okay, so in light of the food matrix concept, we are reconsidering how we assess the health consequences of food beyond the specific nutrients they contain. An important insight from current research is that food is more than the sum of its nutrients. The concept of the food matrix suggests that the nutritional and health effects of a food are due to both its structure and its nutrient composition, and in turn also their interaction. In the case of dairy products, the dairy matrix has been shown to have a positive effect on overall health. It's now my pleasure to close our symposium, Beyond Nutrients, the Health Effects of Whole Foods. Thank you again to our excellent speakers and the very capable team at the IDF for arranging this thought-provoking symposium that we have thoroughly enjoyed. Thank you for listening and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. <laughs> Recording in progress. Hello, everyone. I'm Carol Lois, and I'm the Nutrition Manager for EMF, the European Milk Forum. As some of you all know, EMF is a collection of dairy organisations from 10 European countries who work together on science and communication on the role of dairy in a healthy, sustainable diet across Europe. At EMF, we've communicated on the food matrix and particularly the dairy matrix concept for a number of years. And the video we'll show in a moment is one of the ways we've developed to do this. It's primarily for healthcare professionals, particularly dietitians, but also for nutrition scientists, academics and students of nutrition and dietetics. Our aim with the video is to increase the understanding of and the interest in food and dairy matrix effects on health. We wanted to create something to bring the matrix concept to life and to tell the matrix story in a concise but in an impactful way. Key to this, as I hope you'll see, is the using the analogy of musical chords in the video to help explain the matrix effect. The chords analogy allows for understanding of the matrix effect that it's more than the sum of the individual parts. It doesn't suggest that the individual nutrients are unimportant unless they're together in the matrix, but shows that the effect extends beyond this. It's something unique when the nutrients and the physical structure interact. As we've learned today, we certainly don't know the exact nature of all the interactions, but we do have evidence for the impact of the dairy matrix in some areas, for example, cardiometabolic health. So another key part of the video is having an expert, Dr Emma Feeney from University College Dublin, who you've just heard from, discuss some of the science to date. The video is used by EMF and member organisations at scientific conferences and events on the EMF website and other health professional sites and is available to academics for teaching purposes. And we'll let you see the Matrix video now. The effect that our food has on our bodies, and so on our health, is complicated. Although we have come to associate certain foods with a single nutrient, oranges with vitamin C, or dairy foods with calcium, and with a single effect, saturated fat with heart health, it's much more complex than that. The nutritional and health effects of a food are a result of both the food's structure and its nutrient composition, and how these interact with each other. This is what scientists call the food matrix effect. I would like to show you what the food matrix effect is through a musical experience. Let's take three notes of music. Each of them played separately produces something interesting. But if we combine them, the three notes create a different, much more melodious, deep and powerful chord. The resonance of these notes together produces a unique result that each note individually can't obtain. 
With nutrients and food, it's the same thing. This is the matrix effect. Like a single note, a single nutrient does not work in the same way on its own as it does together with other components of the food. This changes the interaction and affects things such as uptake and bioavailability and results in something different, something unique. Let's take dairy as an example. Milk and dairy products are by their nature complex foods that contain many nutrients and bioactive components. The rich dairy matrix naturally includes calcium, protein, different fatty acids, phosphorus, potassium, iodine, vitamins B2 and B12, and numerous other nutrients and bioactive components that interact with each other. In addition to their nutritional composition, dairy foods also have complex physical matrices, from the solid state of cheese, to the gel-like structure of yogurt, to liquid milk, and so on. The interaction of this unique combination of nutrients and structure in the dairy matrix influences factors such as the digestion and the absorption of nutrients, and so the metabolic response. To sum up, like individual notes that come together to form a chord, a food's effect on health can be different from what might be expected based on a single nutrient or even a few of the nutrients it contains. This is the food matrix effect. But what are the potential advantages of this food matrix effect on health? Beneficial dairy matrix effects have been observed for cardiometabolic health, body composition, and bone health. Let's have a closer look with a scientific expert. The research that we've been doing in UCD um, has really shown that there are specific matrix effects from dairy that we see that we just don't seem to be able to mimic when we look at those individual components. Um, we've seen that when saturated fat is eaten in the form of cheese, we actually see beneficial effects on blood lipid profiles. We think this is due to the calcium content in cheese, but also some of the other components that are present as well. So the phosphorus, the proteins and the type of protein, and then also something called the milk fat globule membrane. The interactions between all of these components seem to be key in this effect. It's the same for bone health. Dairy's beneficial effect on bone is due to more than just the calcium, which we're all familiar with, um, but also the phosphorus and the proteins present in dairy, and they work together in concert there's also emerging evidence to suggest that other bioactive components, such as bioactive peptides and vitamin K, may also be involved. So these food matrix effects really show us why we need to think about moving away from a nutrient-based dietary guideline system towards a more whole food-based one. As nutrition science evolves, we're learning more and more about the food matrix effect and its importance in understanding the impact that food has on our health.